Welcome, welcome to episode nine of Something Up My Sleeve, the show where we interview magicians and other entertainers and ask the question, what is up your sleeve? Metaphorically, of course, or maybe you have something up your sleeve. For example, uh, in my sleeve, I happen to keep this sword, uh, but that's just when I get mugged because uh, it's a good thing to have handy. So everyone has something different up their sleeve, but metaphorically, it means what brings... What do you bring to the table? What makes you different than other performers? And that's where we're going to ask our guests. And uh, I'm really happy to be here with a very special show because we have interviews with the Chicago Magic Lounge. I was so lucky to be performing there and meet the amazing people involved with that venue. It is rare to find a venue so perfect for a magician to perform, a place where we can feel at home. Uh, most theaters do not cater, as many of you know, do not cater to the art of magic. I was so stoked to be there and met some amazing people. So you're going to get to hear from those guys. Uh, but I want to clear the air. I know many of you probably have heard of the controversy. So yes, it was. I mean, it was in the local papers. So I don't know if, it, if you heard of it or not, but I was on Bourbon Street. Uh, I had an altercation. Uh, for those that don't know, I live in New Orleans. I'm broadcasting live from New Orleans. Michael Dardon, hashtag not that magic Mike. And yes, I was in the, the newspaper because a police officer came up to me. I don't agree with all the laws of this city. And, you know, he came up and he said, you have to stop impersonating a flamingo. And I had to put my foot down. So let's see who's with us tonight. Just wanted to open it up with a little bit of an awkward pun. Whenever I figure out how to do it on StreamYard, we will have uh, the sound of crickets available. Scotty, Scotty Phil Phillips, uh, Charles, Arkin, Starbreeze is here. Norma is here. Meadow is here. Welcome, everybody. Jim Hathi is here. PJ, what's up, PJ? Welcome, everybody. And know that we do this once a month. It's called Something Up My Sleeve. It is hosted by the International Brotherhood of Magicians. And we feature many different world-class magicians from all over the world. So I want to uh, say hello. And then basically, we're just going to throw it to uh, – we're going to take a tour, guys. Uh, I don't have to do much. Uh, I'll have some uh, interjections here and there. But we're going to – uh, throw it to a tour of the Chicago Magic Lounge, um, and then I'll tell you about other things that are going on and introduce you to some of our performers. So bear with me as I switch over the video. As you know, this is the slow motion part, but we can let the chat build up anyway because this is amazing. I really don't want people to miss it. Uh, but I thank you guys for being here and know that the IBM is doing more and more online performances, including a magic trivia night coming all the way from Australia. So it's coming from down under to present itself to you guys. And I believe it's going to end up being around 11 o'clock at night, my time, if they stick to the same time period, which is actually perfect for me. So uh, I think it's great that the rest of the world is being represented because we are the international brotherhood of magicians, as you can see by the logo. So let's go to our first video, which is going to be basically an introduction of past me and the lovely Paige Thompson, who is going to give us, did I say it wrong? I just did, didn't I? No, I did it. I did it right. Okay. I have this, let me just uh, throw this out there. I had this fear um, of getting a name wrong ever since I introduced Irma Thomas. Uh, it's Paige Thompson. I introduced Irma Thomas, who I don't know if you guys know is a New Orleans legend in music, in front of 12,000 people. And instead of saying Irma Thomas, I said Irma Thompson. I don't know why. I don't know where I got that. But it helped me to get over the fear of the stage because when you have 12,000 people all looking at you going, and you know you did something wrong, uh, you tend to get the jitters, you know, and then you look over and village people is standing there the cowboy and the construction worker looking at you going it's thomas that's you're supposed to, it's irma thomas so i just said something like oh i'm sorry that's my cousin y'all i got confused so now i'm ready for anything but uh not related at all to irma Tom thomas uh because 
Paige Thompson is going to give us the tour as I get this uh, video ready. So just a moment. Make sure I share the audio. That is a true story. I wish I had made that up. I wish I didn't have to go through the pain of that in the past, but I did not make that up. Uh, that is a true story. Welcome, Georgie. Welcome. Good to see you. Rob is here. Sent by Meadow. Austra Charlene Fox. Could you have a better name than that? Could you have a more beautiful name? Let's see. So I want to go to, yeah, entire screen. Three. Wrong window. Okay, so uh, uh, don't you know, Kirk, I'm a magician, not a tech guy? All right, I think I got it now. I'm a, I'm a magician, not a tech guy. Damn it, Jim, I'm not a tech guy. I'm a magician. There we go. Beautiful. All right, here she is, the lovely Paige, and we're about to walk in through a laundromat. And I'm going to tell you more about my experience in a moment, but I want you to get a, a good tour of the lounge here. So here we are. Audio oh, is hashtag on. Hashtag not that magic. Mike, and we're at the Chicago Magic Lounge, which is absolutely gorgeous. I've had the privilege of working here, and I'm with, with Paige Thompson, who not only works here at the Magic Lounge, but also has her own show starting next month. And uh, we can't wait to see what that's all about. It's called a page. A page in time. A page in time. Lover. She's going to be time traveling. Uh, <laughs> like that. So uh, she's going to give us a tour of this amazing venue. So I'll let you take it yes. away. Okay. Welcome to Chicago 5050 North Clark Street. You enter through this very mysterious doorway. And you're like, hmm, people are like, are we at the right place? Yeah. And then they get more confused. Because, oh, laundry going on. So what's nice about this is these actually do work. They do really. Yeah, they okay, do. If we went and did laundry at the, the apartment place. <laughs> and thinking that I doubt they work. And no. I was going to ask. So we, could done, we really could have done laundry. That's great. So here, here it is. And then people think, oh, are we at the right place? And yes, you are. You just welcome inside. Da -da -da. Here we are. Now, real quick, have you seen Archer? No. It's a cartoon Archer. So they're special agents and they have to get into a lot That's what I thought. I thought maybe they had a lot of that. Yeah, Archer. Oh. They do a lot of that. It's going to the special agent agency. Oh, that's cool. So cool. That's really cool. This is our library. Yeah, so magicians can come, have a little drink, read a book. All of these you can like have a magician here, check out, read while you're here, or take them home for a little bit if you want to learn some more magical information. Uh, books for uh, some of our viewers, it's like an iPad yeah. on paper. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Good. Good. Thank you. I forgot. People don't know what books are. So yes, this is our mysterious entrance way that we will not reveal that you have to get here to see the mysterious entrance into the theater. It's magic. Yeah. Here we got our bar. It's already popping. We already have people coming in. If you want to just follow me, you can see the ball. Okay, are you the magician? Welcome to the Chicago Magic Club. My name is the Amazing Bennett. What a pleasure it is to see you here this evening. And I can vouch for the fact that he is truly amazing. He's truly amazing. Have you ever been here before? No? Well, welcome. First time. Hi. You made it. Yeah, 
Yes. And how often do we have a bar magician performing for those here? And how do they get to see that? So you can come in without a ticket to the show and see the bar magician. Anytime, any of our open hours, so 5 p.m., there's a bar magician right here. So we close every night of the week. And yeah, you don't have to have a ticket. You can just come have a drink and watch the magic pet here. Let's take a little peek in here just because it's some people's favorite. Yeah. It is a restroom, but it's also. <laughs> one of them in the bathroom. Chicago has more magic history than any other city, and our lovely MC Jam Rose every night tells the audience about the magic history. It's a wonderful moment for them to realize that they're part of something special. I learned so much being here. Me too. Makes me want to move to Chicago, honestly. Like, no, really. when I when I moved to Chicago, I found out there was a Chicago style magic. I was very confused because I did not know that was a thing until I was here. Yeah, I thought it was just pizza. <laughs> and the 
This is my favorite place to perform in this venue. Okay. Beautiful I didn't know that. I would have thought that stage is your favorite. So. Oh, this so is just such a cool spot. This is intimate setting. People are just like you All right, who's jealous? Who's jealous? I can't even look at it. I'm so hashtag jealous right now because I want that venue in New Orleans. Uh, by the way, uh, whoever left these glasses in the dressing room, I'm keeping them. I, I figured they were for Mysterion because, I mean, look at them. But uh, apparently not. So if they're not for Chris, I don't know who they're for. I didn't mean to steal them. I was trying to give them back. I will mail them to you if you can prove they're yours. But uh, right now I look like, uh, I don't know. Tony Stark or something, or uh, what's the, you know, loathing and leaving Vegas. Um, I don't know who's from Vegas. So, uh, yeah, these I picked up. Not, like, not only did I have the privilege of performing in that beautiful space, but I walked away with these glasses. But now I can't see anything because hashtag wizard. So that was that was great. That was a great. And, and thank you so much, Paige. Um, Paige is going to have her own show on, I believe, Wednesday nights at the Chicago Magic Lounge. From the moment I walked in, not only the, the magicians were so nice, respectful, and, and just fun to be around, but the staff, everybody on the staff, they would have a team meeting before every show, and it felt like summer camp. Everybody's cheering, encouraging everyone. They're like, who's working tonight? Let's see who's here. And it was, it was so much fun. I couldn't wait to get there. I feel so... Uh, so privileged, so privileged to be a part of that, that, you know, that, and the fact that while I was there, I did have a nice Popeye's dinner. I went to Popeye's. I mean, I could die tomorrow. I'm happy. Uh, I want to go back there so bad. And I want to create a venue here like that. As you can tell, it's amazing. Uh, so we're going to continue. Uh, actually we're going in order of the event because you walk in through the laundry room, uh, then you go into the bar. Uh, you sort of see some memorabilia. You get some Chicago magic history. You see the place. Uh, you see how classy it is. And then you see the stage show. And I was featuring for Mentalist. Now, I know that I'm the one that usually – what's it? well, the – set. well, yeah, but so I'm getting to my point. So the Sentimentalists were the headlining act, but they are Mentalist because that's what they do. And those of you that know me know that I'm the one that says, uh, oh, is, is it time for the mentalist act? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the bathroom now. Let me tell you, they will grab your attention and they will fry your mind. They did that to me in the dressing room. And I know that Steffi K remembers my dream about saving a drowning squirrel. Let me explain something to you. I've been in magic 30 years, okay? 30 years experience, and I don't, I don't know how it's all done. I don't know everything. I'll, I'll be the first to admit I don't know the, all the secrets. I like that. I like the fact that I'm still bewildered every day. But how in the hell 
Does Steffi K have a chalkboard that she sets on the counter? Ask me about my dream. I say I saved a, a baby squirrel from drowning. And then she turns over the chalkboard and she has drowning squirrel written on it. Nobody, that's not a common dream. Okay, it's not like, oh yeah, I had another dream again where my twin sister murders me. It's not a common thing, okay? I don't care what you say. Nobody dreams about saving a drowning squirrel. That was a one time, I'm, I, I can look at my dream journal. It doesn't, there's not pages of this. How could she know? How could she have written that down? I don't understand and I I'm, gonna, I'm over it. I don't want to. So we're going to go now to the stage act and that will actually to the interview after the stage act. I apologize. There's a lot of sound because, you know, there's stuff going on in the lounge the whole time. We grabbed a little corner area and I interviewed the sentimentalist. So we're going to pull that up right now. Uh, go ahead and ask your questions in chat. Take it away as I make sure that I have the sound working. Uh, Billy, what have what, you been traveling all day? What do you think you could just go to bed when I'm in the middle of this? I mean, this is live. This is live entertainment, Billy. So put me on the background like I do with The Office, please, or something. Like, can you have, what do you listen to at night? Alanis Morissette? Just put me on instead. Like, seriously. You're the president of the IBM. You're not allowed to sleep. To quote Sean Farquhar, sleep is for the week. Because when I sleep... It's for a week. Wake up, Billy. <laughs> this is hopefully the edited version. So before I uh, get this video going, I just want to give a shout out to Meadow Perry, who not only was working camera, but also edited some of these with B-roll and the sound is 100% better. So you have Meadow to thank because they were, there was a lot of partying going on. I mean, it's a kicking club. Enjoy the interview with some of my new favorite people, the sentimental. And uh, we are here with the Sentimentalists, so we have Steffi K and Mysterion, and I have had the privilege of watching their show, what, how many times is that now? Uh, four. How many have we done? Okay, four times, uh, completely blown away each time. My first question always, because the name is something on my sleeve, is what is up your sleeve? Meaning, metaphorically, what do you bring to the table that makes you, you, separate you from other performers? I guess what we do is completely unique to us because we built what we do. And it's, uh, it's not something you can find in our book. Um, although, I guess there's it's quite version. Yeah, idea of inklings, but um, it's, it's unique to us, which makes it fun and super personal and difficult. Yeah. And it makes it really difficult for people who might be in the know to figure it out because they're not seeing anything they've never seen before in the sense that if they're looking for cues or clues, you're not going to find them because the way that Steffi and I do it is invisible. So, yeah, I think it's a different spin on the classic two-way celebrity. I would say it's pretty invisible. Uh, I'm, obviously, I don't consider myself mentalist, but being in magic for 30 years, I feel like I know what to look for. But even backstage, they were blowing my mind. I wanted to leave. I was like, I'm done. I want to walk out because there's like totally ripping my brain apart. Um, one question I have to ask is because I've been a solo act for a while, work with partners, but at what point, I'm always curious is when you decide we're doing a duo act. So yes. take me through that. that so I worked for years as a Mysterion and I had my different shows that I would tour around with or produce in Canada and I would come down to the States but not all and I was comfortable. Um, I had my fingers in a lot of pies in the entertainment world and also in other industries and I was doing a talent contest and Steffi was on the show and she was performing uh, the art of art, which is the word 
speed drawing. drawing oh, pin -up really? Girls. Yeah. Wow. Instead of the other girls were doing burlesque, she would only pin up the wasn't. So it stood out, and I, you know, thought to myself, uh, you know, who is this young woman? And, and this is someone who, who was very involved in the burlesque right. industry there in Toronto, and um, he knew everybody. And so I came onto the stage, and he'd never seen me before, and he thought that I would work really well doing something. And, um, and doing something. Doing something. something. Anyway. And he, he initially offered to teach me, uh, not teach me, but to get me into burlesque. And, and I said, Thankfully she said no. <laughs> well, I, I, had, I said, I'm like, I have no interest in that. He goes, I saw dolls. what do you want to do? <laughs> and I go, uh, uh, magic and he well he offered he was like do you want to do magic I said, absolutely so he started teaching me the basics and I was reading books and when I was reading through books I stumbled across something it was in a Henry Gordon book and it was just I really liked the way that it was um, explained everything was very basic and simple something that I could imagine someone who's new to magic could imagine doing and there was one uh, effect with putting your temples on, um, I guess, a confederate temple, and when you, when you clench your jaw, you can feel wow, the yeah. move, so he would, yeah, so it was cueing the letters, and I thought, there's got to be an easier way to do that, and that's what inspired me to, to I showed it to him, I go, what is that, what is this, I want to do this, and uh, he goes, well, it's, there's different variations of it, you can do this, do this, do this, and we got into it, and then within two weeks, we started yeah, within two weeks we're doing it. Yeah. And that's been how long now that you've called it? Seven years. Wow. So Minus two for COVID. Oh, of course. Right. Um, so here's here's something an interesting question. Of, I love hearing uh, a layperson's perspective on on magic. And, because I feel like sometimes they think out of the box and we can limit ourselves as magicians because yeah. we know too much. So since she was coming on fresh, she had been in magic for a while. When she started reading, coming up with ideas, did you find that that maybe there was ideas you wouldn't have thought of or i think that i already i still think like a lay person really i do yeah i don't really see. you don't look like a lay person <laughs> well i don't know if i do or no but, but i definitely do think like a lay person because i try not to oversaturate my mind with what's out there i only look at what i need to look at because otherwise you're you know you're gonna buy all these things that are gonna just sit on the shelf and not use it. So I learned early that less is more. So I kind of just you know, and I don't really hang out with magicians because no one loves me, including my mother. And she's a really good magician. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I I I did though see a different approach when Steffi came in and where I would have things like uh, multiple out or something like that. Had the teacher, and she would come up with other things that they could do to change it into maybe not now, but change it into another effect. So there was all sorts of different um, alterations to uh, approaches that I've been using for, uh, for, for a long time. Um, but I think you have to sort of steer away from what other people are doing and be unique. Uh, definitely something I did from day one and got a lot of you know, flack for that in, in the magic field. There were people going, I can't believe this guy's doing corporate. He's putting in dead babies in jars and weird things like this. And yeah, you're doing it wrong. But you're doing it wrong. Oh, well, I'm working uh, 300 shows a year. It's not wrong. It's just different. It's just different. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, well, okay, wait. Before we talk about uh, pen and paper, I definitely want to ask you questions there. Uh, I found it very amusing being back behind the laymen that are watching you during your show and overhearing their theories as to how it's done. And that was one, which was which was great because you just called out someone's thoughts and said you think it's the glasses. Um, so I heard some really interesting uh, everything from uh, from your rings clicking to contact lenses. Uh, so what I, I'm wondering, what are some of the craziest theories people have given you as to how you're doing? Yeah, I mean contact lenses is one yeah. that comes up quite a bit. Rings clicking, we've never heard. I've never so heard. So that, that was before. that was people sitting next to me said, I know his ring clicks. Oh no, that was Georgie said that Georgie. My friend said, I know what he's doing. Georgie. He's clicking the rings. He's clicking the Georgie. rings. Georgie. Georgie. There's well, nothing Georgie. with the rings. This is how he separates himself from Layman. You want to play with George? <laughs> Georgie's um, in the chat, by the way. Georgie's in the chat. All right. Georgie was oh, here last well, night. He says, now. great performance I'm last night. Not Thank the you, Georgie. Thank you, Georgie. Um, yeah, just weird things like um, you have somebody that the side of the stage whispering to her. Um, and then to that, I mean, hold your hands up to your eyes. What can you see? It's really difficult. Like, you 
you right. can't see anything. If something's that close, if there's a screen that's that close, you can't see it. Which is great because when you pull someone on stage, they get to see that you can't see through anything. And they're not hearing other other bells and whistles. And we don't use anything large in the sense that it's this giant screen with words and numbers or whatever. You know, you're writing a word on a paper the size of a regular post, yeah. word and you're folding it up. I can't even see it when I'm looking at it. I'm blind. I'm using prescription glasses. I can't see it. The either. lenses <laughs> pop out sometimes. They do. They pop out. Great. The heat, right? They're vintage. They'll pop up. I can't see a thing. And uh, especially after that, which that people can see. Um, and there's no, you know, we know that there's equipment that you can buy that can send you the same information. So sort of like, let's pad a paper and start. Um, if you don't trust ours, lend us yours. Right. And, and that brings up my next question. As you know, I'm an improv guy. I love improv situations. I think that's what makes the show fun. And I think my favorite part is that I know, especially having seen the show now many times, that there's a lot of improv going on, especially when you're going through the crowd, pulling things out of people's walls. Like last night, somebody gives you, it was a court summons, I think. Yeah. And you say on stage, like, we've never had that before. Um, so you've got these improv moments, they're pulling things out, no way she could know, objects you've never even uh, ha happened upon. Have there been moments when, because it's kind of improv, that you, you're not getting it? And if so, what do you do to cover? How do you get out of those moments? I'll tell you what, there's two things that we've been handed that are very unusual. Right. One being a trout's head from someone's dinner. Oh my god. They purposely what are you, a cartoon? Yeah. Yeah. Bugs, 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 right? Ah, there you go. Funny cat. Um, <laughs> second thing was a loaded gun. What? Oh, Okay, that's a little inappropriate. And it was in Canada. It was in Canada? Yeah. How did he get into Canada? When he lived there. Okay. He just had a gun. He had a few drinks. He thought it was funny. Oh, that's hilarious. Somebody pulled their dentures out, their dental plate, with teeth on it, and gave it to me to guess what it was. It was like right in my hand. I'm like, what? What is that? I'm like, oh, for God's sake, it's dentures. And that was where COVID started. Yeah. <laughs> um, the most unusual thing was at the House of Cards. Somebody handed me a flashlight, and I didn't realize it wasn't a flashlight, it was a taser. And I tased he's trying myself. To, he's trying to open myself. it, and he goes, uh. <laughs> myself, and just like laughing. Now, that's where the white stripe in my hair came from, right? No, no that is true. And I'm tasing you, bro. I've been electrocuted. I've been hit by lightning. That's true. That's really? Yes. Is that the hair? Is that I know. Okay. That's L'Oreal 16. <laughs> The 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 yeah, biggest of my life in two thousand seven, I think it was. But um, and you don't feel anything; you just see black in your back. You can read minds. It's weird. Uh, I was at, I was in Hawaii, in Ohio, and uh, I ran across the parking lot uh, as it was pouring rain. And the next thing I know, I was inside the uh, donut shop. Hey, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, where am I? And I saw this flash and all of a sudden you're lying. Uh, no, I've never heard of that one before. Kayla and uh, George were oh, cool. I guess I never asked that one. Yeah. Hey, have you ever been struck by lightning? Yeah, you gotta ask specific questions. Yeah. <laughs> ask questions, get answers. But anyway, that being wow. said, uh, why was I telling that story? I don't know, but it was a great story. Yeah, it's a cool story, Ralph. Oh, the things that have happened. I you think know, you should buy a lottery tickets. Yeah. yeah, I buy he them does. all the time. I, okay. I, I never win. Um, you know, we have outs. And sometimes we don't know. I mean, with Where? outs, with outs, and if you are doing mind reading, um, it's not always about getting it exactly. To say that you're picking up a color or a shape sure. or just something in general. Oh, is this to do with such and such? I mean, that's still a hit, even if it's not exact. Right. And you can get. And it shouldn't be an exact science. If it's coming to you, we don't know how you're seeing it. And um, I don't know if it falls under the, the too perfect rule, but if you're nailing it, um, it, it's almost more suspicious than if you're kind of seeing it and you're getting it. Yeah. I feel like that's so much stronger to know. Uh, like for instance, last night when you had the one date and you wait, wait, no, no, it's it's 2019 or whatever it was. Uh, and it was like, I was almost there, I'm close, I got it. And uh, that just creates a sense of yeah. realism for me, for sure. And I think my bullshit that I play around with spectators, you know, it's an uh, image of you in a dress. No, not even close. It's a dog dancing. No, not even close. It's two guys playing 
snuck her. No, not too close. All right, Stephanie, you know, uh, we're not going to send the guesselists. So I can throw out all the, you know, I can throw out all the, the stupid answers. So it sort of takes away from her. Mm -hmm. Uh, reveals. Right, right. Um, and that kind of, I think, takes away the audience uh, from realizing this. Always well, what was it you said last night when someone actually, he was like wanting them to think of something, they yelled it out. You scored. Was it, uh, remind, not how the game played. Rem remind no, readers, not, not, we're not my, is that what it is? Remind readers. Listeners. We're not my listeners. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. You know, you have one drunk idiot, like, yells it out. Hello! <laughs> like, don't tell me. All right, so, because um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I definitely got to talk about they did pull Penn and Teller. They have the trophy to prove it, so which leaves me hashtag jealous. Um, and as, as I told you, I'm hoping to go on the show. But uh, first question is, uh, at what point or how did you decide what you were going to do? We were in year one. Okay. Oh, really? Is it been that? No, we were in year one. We had only been performing. Oh, you're year, year one. Okay, gotcha. Year Not season one of no. year one. So, so we actually submitted um, this, uh, writing down a celebrity name and having me tell them what it is. And uh, we got an email back saying, sorry, um, you can't use Confederates. You can't do pre-show. Um, we don't allow any of that. And we said, that's not what we did at all. We truly did just do it on the spot. It was on stage at one of our shows. And they go, mm, no, it looks like it's someone you might know. It wasn't. It really wasn't. And we do it all the time. And now, is this the, the, not the opening, the second that I've seen? This, this is the only time we were on. So we pitched that effect. We pitched that effect first. Okay, and they said, said no. no. And so we resubmitted something else. And they said yes to it. And that's what you did. On no, no, I meant, uh, is this what I've seen in, in the show? Yes. Uh, yes. Here, because yes. I saw you ask for so. Okay, yes. which is which is great effect. Thank you. Okay, so, so, we did so that. that was a no, and then... And then they said yes. Okay. Then we went on, but when we did the segment where we were chatting with Allison, on the fly, I just thought to myself, <laughs> yes, I'm just going to do a trip with Allison, which no other act has ever done. Oh, well, yes. they'll do... No, 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 not during the interview. Oh, really? Really? oh no, no. Oh, no. I could have said it. Oh, during the interview segment, yeah. you did that. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so we did the thing with celebrity, and she wrote Elvis, and Stephanie was like, I'm going to learn about Elvis. And holy cow, we kind of did that in the show, though, but I've never was it set up. Like, right. That original idea sure. was just being done right there, super quick, as part of the package. Um, and then it came back to the end. So, you know, we pitched the effect we did after talking with. Uh, Anastasia and amazing Donovan, God bless them. And uh, they came up with the idea of using a wind machine. Yeah, we need a wind machine. Put these things in a wind machine. We have them fly all over the place. We just catch them. It's really easy that way. People think I had it on my sleeve. Yeah. Um, no. And of course, you, you'll see it if you go back. To, like, we'll put the YouTube link uh, when we actually air this um, on Tuesday night. But uh, essentially, they're in a money machine, and now. I, I assume this wasn't a regular bit, but that was designed for the show. It was, it was Penn and Teller's money machine. Money. And they, they oh, had wait, no so idea it was theirs. Oh, and oh, they were really? like looking up there like, did you get this yours? Did you bring this? It's like, no, oh, I didn't. Goodness. It was yours, actually. Production let us use their money yeah. machine. Okay, well, I didn't know that. So they, got talent. They're examining their own prop. Yeah. yeah. Not even realizing yep, it. And they, and they needed to examine it. Yeah, they just didn't realize it. Came. You probably did do great. Yeah, yeah. 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 sure. Yeah. And then on American Got Talent, I think they rented one for us from the party supply shop. And then in Toronto, we could get it from a friend of ours who rented the Skype thing. Oh, so yeah, and I didn't even mention that in addition, uh, they've also been on America's Got Issues. Um, and my favorite part is uh, when anyone can basically mentally slap Simon in the face, uh, which is what I saw him do because uh, Simon thought he was on to you and was basically um, kind of heckling your act. And you were like, you know what? Uh, let's try something. And um, shut, him up. shut him up, which is kind of hard to do, but like, I don't know him, but it just to me, I'm like, he that it. guy, I he did like He was so happy, you yeah. know, like thinking about that yeah. thing from his childhood. Cool. Interesting, um, just with the Penn and Teller when we were on Fool Us, the audience had so much time to draw, and that was something that we didn't account for. Oh, yeah. um, they had the pass the paper and the, and the markers, and people were drawing whole things. And so when we went to the images after, there were some really serious things. The image that was chosen was a flower, but it was a mandala flower. Now, I had to make a very quick decision in 
that moment of whether or not I was going to draw a lot, and then there would be cuts to the final edit. And that was the one thing we discussed with this production before, which was that we do not want there to be any cuts, or if there are, that they're seamless, to show that I'm not being, like sure. I'm not looking at the screen, or a microphone screen or something, nothing like that, right? And uh, anyway, I, I made the decision to draw a flower as opposed to a like detailed flower, and I'm, and I'm like, like, oh god, like is this the right thing called to make? But it, it was because there's no cuts. It would have either been, you know, the people looking at it going, oh well, it was cut, versus, you know, it was, it was yeah, it's reality. It's all in one go. So, yeah, and when you're watching on TV, you haven't, that's the problem with it, you have a very specific look, but of course they could have done it if they had a TV, and yeah. uh, you just have to know that, you can tell the artist to know for that, uh, that's not the fact to know that. Um, and I can tell that you're a great artist, because last night, essentially in front of the crowd, she drew what I would look like an NSFW Calvin and Hobbes, is what I was calling it. Um, that was fantastic, but of course it was based on their prediction that you had to draw. Um, that was great. Uh, of course, that guy took a long time to uh, determine that he was, that was that was what he was going for. Yeah, he was supposed to have a first time memory. Uh, so we're gonna we gotta wrap this up and of course uh, get to our second set of yeah, performance. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap it up with this: um, the future. Uh, where do you see yourself going in the future, man? I think you know, uh, COVID kind of. The momentum that we were rolling with. Um, we had a few things in the works for television and some other. Some really big things in Canada, too, with uh, national, national things. And it was spoiled, unfortunately. Um, but and that's not the end. We uh, made a venture to a
don't think anybody's going to forget the remaining year. It has been a pleasure working with you. I wish we could keep this going forever, but of course we got work to do. Uh, so what we're going to do is say goodbye to the sentimentalist. Uh, we'll put all their all their links in the chat and uh, tune in for more of what they are doing. And we're, we'll, we'll turn the camera around and like. Uh... How can there how can there be how can there be two of us? What the. Well, that one in particular was a longer video. So more footage yet to come. Uh, that was the headlining act of last weekend where they uh, they fried some people's brains so bad that like one girl just had to turn around. She could she just like couldn't handle it. She just put her head down, couldn't handle it. She's like, no, I no, I just need a moment. I just need a moment. Um, and I already said they fried my brain. The Sentimentalist uh, is so cool that I get to hang out with these amazing, talented people. And half the time, I have no idea what they're doing. Other magicians will pretend they know. They'll be like, oh, yeah, I studied that. I'm like, I don't have a clue. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't have a clue. Don't ask me. I don't know. And uh, that is Steffi K and that other guy. I think he has a normal name like Chris, but Mysterion, and uh, he not only has uh, a mentalism trick for any occasion, he has a joke for any occasion. It's amazing. And now we're going to take it to uh, just pretend you're walking, walking, walking. You were like, oh, my God, that was incredible. We saw two. What, what was that? I don't know how it was done, but there's more. There's more. We're going to take you to the close-up room. The 654 Club, if you know what I mean. Oh, but first, but first, as per tradition, we got to do, how did we lose time? How do we lose time? I have no idea. How did I figure that wrong? All right, we're going to go over, because of course, I mean, those of you that, you, you know you're here to see David. Par, I mean, come on. Like, if you're going to go through your – those of you that are here for the history of magic, I have no idea. I lost track of time. I think it's the time change, the difference of, like, I'm in CST. So we're going to have to do the real quick pose contest because we have David Parr coming up next. So let me try to bring you through very quickly. Everyone who's here gets a vote. As long as you see all three pictures – you get a vote for the best magician's pose. So each one of these episodes, I try to have the best magician's pose contest. Because if you've seen a picture of a magician, then, then you understand what I mean by the magician's pose. Meadow, what do you mean? I talk too much. I was keeping it short. I don't understand. I don't understand. Uh... I thought I did the math, but it's fine. It's fine. We're just going to end it on, on David, and we're good. All right. So, But I I put the work in, so damn it. We're going to do the Magician's Pose Contest, okay? And our first one is a competitor that you've seen in the tour. Okay, this is Paige springing cards forward toward the cameraman, which looks amazing. But unfortunately, this is a traditional Magician's Pose. And this is Paige. Thompson, Magician's Pose, number one. Number two is, ooh, not so typical Magician's Pose, but do you believe in ghosts? Is this the best Magician's Pose of a ghost overlooking a beautiful woman? Or would Houdini go, no, brah, no, brah. I got you, man. Like, come on. Obviously, you got Photoshop. You took a picture with your iPhone 9, and then you changed the opacity to look like a ghost. I got you. That's what Houdini would have said. So that is your option for pose number two. And pose number three is... Oh, now, let's consider this one. Pose number three is your next guest who is... Going to do an interview with me on the show. Uh, we lost time. We lost time. I'm going to pretend I'm Edward Norton. 
and I'm telling Richard Gear, although I look more, I think I look more like Richard Gear, but I'm gonna play. I think just, I mean, you know, the silver, but I'm gonna play Edward Norton. I lost time. I lost time because I don't know how it's so late, but I don't care because we have David Parr, and you have an interview with David Parr in the close-up room of the Chicago Magic Lounge. So I don't care what you have to do tomorrow. You stay here, Billy, and watch the show. This is David Parr for an audition reel he had to do for Macbeth. And now, <laughs> I was sorry, I was trying to keep a straight face and I laughed at my own joke. Now, number four. Oh, no, we have three. So, no, 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 there is no. We, <laughs> sorry, I almost messed up my own joke. So, you are going to now choose in the chat, put in your favorite. Uh, some of you may vote for. David Parr in his his rendition of Macbeth. That's actually he got that skull. That's a relative. He kept it. He was supposed to dispose of it in a river, uh, and he was like, "This would make a good prop." And I think it's like his aunt's or something. I don't know. Um, so that's David Parr is number three. Uh, the ghost of a mentalist is what we're calling the <laughs> the ghost of a mentalist, like. How is that in the afterlife? You think you're like, oh, I'm I'm in paradise, but I gotta, but this guy's still reading my mind. Like, can you just go? You know what? Go over there. I'm gonna stay on this side of the lake. You stay over there. I picture there's a lake. You go on that, Chris. Go on that side of the lake. I'm gonna stay over here. Yeah. No, I don't need to know that you think I'm. I want tacos. You said tacos, so of course I want tacos. I, I'm tired of your mentalist tricks. And then the first one is of Paige um, cleverly throwing cards. It looks amazing, but it has to fall under the category of stereotypical, typical, typical, typical magician's pose, pose, pose. And you get a vote. You can put one, two, or three. Um, Norma is very quickly adding up the scores to let me know, based on the chat participation, who won the Magician's Pose contest. And it looks like it might be actually me. It looks like I win the Magician's Pose contest for Photobomb. Photo bombing the beautiful and amazingly talented Steffi. I win the magician's pose. Con I tell I call this Latigra. This is my Latigra pose. And what's great is we're getting a shot right before she notices, so she steals into it, and then the moment after is like, "What are you doing? What? Why are you? I didn't know you were here. Stop it! Just can you?" I'm trying to look pretty. This is like beauty and the least. Can you move? Can you move, please? Thank you. So this wins the Magician's Pose Contest. Congratulations, Steffi. But more congratulations to past me for knowing the exact moment to photobomb. Once again, a beautiful moment by hashtag not that magic mic. And now let's continue with our interviews. Forget the time. It's fine. What are you going to do? Like watch something on Netflix. They're making the same stories over and over. Frozen 2 should have been called Thawed, but it's not. Okay, so don't bother. So now we are going to do. Actually, this is the first performer ever at the Chicago, the Chicago Magic Lounge. First performer ever and the oldest running magic show in Chicago is what I'm sharing with you. So can you please like put down your burrito for a moment, put down your, can you pay attention, please? Can you? Yes. Thank you. No, put the cards down, put down your deck of cards because you might learn something. Jeez. I know all these magicians are like, I'll, I'll watch his show, but I'm going to practice my my pharaoh just put the cards down this is good this is good stuff i just have to figure out charles knows thank you thank you george you know hold on a second and this is in the close-up lounge 
This is in the 654 Club. We are here at the Chicago Magic Lounge in the beautiful 654 Club, and we are here with none other than David Parr, who most magicians have already heard of. He's uh, well known in the magic world and an inventor of magic um, and brilliant concepts, and also is one of the people that can claim to have fooled Penn and Teller. Uh, with a really great routine that now I know fools a lot of people because uh, we yeah. saw many people trying to figure it out, um, including the mentalist who should have been able to grab it out of your head. So I want to ask you some questions about that. But first, my first question is always, uh, what is something up your sleeve? Meaning metaphorically, what do you believe you bring to the table that makes you you as a performer? All my past experience, you know, I, I realized years ago as an actor, um, doing roles in plays and stuff like that. The more of myself I bring to this role, the happier everyone's going to be. And by that, I mean um, the, the audience, you know, because they'll sense the sincerity of my performance. They'll sense that it's genuine. Uh, the director, because the director cast me to, for me. If they didn't want someone with my qualities, they would have cast somebody else. Right. And me, because then I can just relax and enjoy my performance and be myself right right so uh so i don't have to like you know up to that at the point i had that realization i was i was wondering you know i was worrying about you know who does the audience expect me to be who does the director want me to be and all this stuff and it was just making me nervous and uncomfortable in my own skin and and when i finally realized the more of me i bring to the world that is my personal history, my interests and obsessions, my quirks, all that stuff, the happier everyone's going to be. And I can relax and enjoy the process of acting. And that applies to magic, too. I can Absolutely. relax and be myself when I'm on stage. And then I, I just don't, I'm, I'm not burdening myself with all kinds of weird, unrealistic expectations and stuff. I can think of a key moment in your close-up show that I want to bring up now that I believe relaxes the audience, relaxes you, and kind of just shows who you are and your personality. And I have a question about that moment, but I'm guessing that this is a perfect example. When you say, do you ever deserve a Pez? Or do you ever feel like when you call the Pez candy? Yeah. Um, it's one of those moments when I just felt very genuine. I'm like, I'm no, I get to know this guy because of that one little moment. But my question was, is that just that type of moment? Is it just a fun moment? Or is that involved with some type of misdirection? It is. It's actually, there's a practical purpose for that. Oh, there is. Too. Okay. Wow. Okay. Like if you can convey your persona at the same time you're doing something sneaky, that's, that's great. I only wondered about <laughs> it later. So whatever it was, I have no idea oh, what good. was happening because to good. me, I'm just like going, I want a Pez too. I want a Pez. <laughs> uh, and then later I'm realizing that was such a fun moment. Hold on a second. Did he just grab me like a layman because I was captured captured in that fun moment? But that's that is the power of narrative. It's the power of story. You know, we're we're so human beings are so programmed to respond to it that when I reveal something about me as a person, you're automatically engaged and you're not paying attention to technique and all that other right. stuff that we don't want them to pay attention to. So the most powerful tool in my Toolbox is narrative, right? It's it's revealing, telling a story about myself, about you, the audience, or about us collectively. Now, when you you've been actually on uh, Penn and Teller twice, mm -hmm. um, and when you went on the first time was the, the first time was a fuller. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, when you went on, you I found interesting that you actually tried to avoid doing a card trick, and you didn't send them the trick that you that they yeah. eventually wanted you to do. This was, this was the mistake I made. When, when magicians ask me for advice about how to get onto Fool Us, this is the advice I give them. I tell them that I assumed that the producers did not want to see card magic because I just thought they probably get hundreds of card tricks sure. and they're not going to want to see another one. So I, when I pitched them ideas, I pitched them like about five or six routines and it was all non-card magic and they rejected all of them. Wow. And the next round, I did the same thing, pitched them all non-card stuff. They rejected all of them, but 
they saw on my YouTube channel a, a card effect that I did in my show in Chicago here, and they were like, can you do that? And I was wow. like, well, I, I didn't send that to you because I didn't think you'd be interested. And they were like, oh, no, that's great, because they knew the back and forth game of it with Allison Hannigan was going to be good television. Right. So uh, okay, that makes sense. So the lesson I learned is don't try to anticipate what the producers want. Right. Because you don't know what they want. In fact, I don't think they know what they want until they see it. Sure. That makes so sense. pitch them every idea you have. Don't hold any back. Okay. And they'll tell you what they're interested in. Excellent. Um, I should mention, of course, also that uh, David has had the longest running magic show in Chicago and has since become the first performer ever at the Chicago Magic Lounge. So uh, basically kind of a legend here. And um, we're learning more this weekend because uh, I've done uh, a whole uh, tour of the place and everything about how much history there is about magic in Chicago. Uh, now, at what point did, did you actually, when you agreed to do that particular effect, um, the, the reason you did set it in was it was a card trick, but did you believe it would fool them? I figured I had about a 40% chance of fooling them. And I say that because I know Teller must know the principle it's based on. Okay. And he, he might even have the book that inspired the thought that led to creating it on his shelf somewhere. Probably. And so I just thought, I, I probably got a 40% chance. But then I started showing the, the piece to some of my friends in magic, some right. of my magician friends. And I just, I'd perform it and I'd say, so what's your theory? And many of them said, oh, I got so caught up in the back and forth game of it, I forgot to look for signs of the method. Which is exactly what you want. And that's exactly what happened to Penn and Teller, I wow. think. Um, yeah. And, and they and just got caught up in it. And then when it's, once it's done, it's very hard to re construct to reverse engineer sure uh and i guess you know the mis misdirection of that bell uh just just no in fact uh the moment when she didn't hit it and then you're like <laughs> that was just, it was like it was getting to me like she better hit the bell or this is not going right uh it gets to the point where like it's like the symmetry or something of like it's got to happen but this is another example the back and forth game is basically a narrative the, it's a right. It's a, it's a story of our journey with these decks of cards and the bell, and we don't know where it's leading. There's going to be a surprise finish, and so that that's just as compelling as a story. Basically, it's just a story without words. And now you we were talking about what we don't see if you're watching on TV is the is the conversation that they're having while Allison is talking to you, and they had told you that usually they'll take about five minutes. Three to five minutes, the producer said, uh, that they would confer to come up with a theory. I thought, okay, I think the, the method's buried deep enough in the game and all that to, to hide it. And so uh, so when, when uh, we went to record it, I finished up the piece. Allison and I step around the table. She starts to interview me. Three minutes went by. Five minutes went by. And... We kept looking over at Penn and Teller and they're still talking. They're like very intensely like talking to each other. So we went back to the interview and eventually she ran out of questions to ask me. Sure. So I started interviewing her. I was like, Allison, you, you see a lot of magic. Do you, do you like to just like enjoy the mystery of it and not knowing how it's done? Or do you, do you like to try to figure out the method? And she was like, well, kind of a little of both. And so we, we chatted and then we kept glancing over at Penn and Teller. They're still talking. And so now they're drawing on pads of paper, right? So now we're at the 10 minute mark, like double what wow. the producer said. And I'm just thinking, well, by now they have to have narrowed it down, like process of elimination of what methods they ruled out right. will eventually lead to the one, right? So I just thought I'm sunk. They're, they've, they have to have figured it out by now. They have to admit well, with enough time. That's what they, there's got to be. It's got to be a fair game. If they have two days to talk right. about it, then how could you possibly ever? Fall? Right. Well, it's got to be a time. I was like, I just I gestured to Allison, like, <laughs> what what do we do? And she just said, I think they've talked long enough. So she went, boys, boys, what's your verdict? 
So she stopped them or they would have kept going. And uh, so I, I thought they, by then they knew the method. So I was bracing myself to not look disappointed. <laughs> and then he did give you an honest method. And that was that um, you would need to be hospitalized. <laughs> you needed to break their legs so yeah. that you could invent a trick like this. <laughs> right. Um, and, and essentially that's what happened. Uh, and Penn already knew that because he didn't hear Allison you telling Allison the story, but he brought it up about the fact that you, you I broke guess, your leg. yeah, yeah. It was, it was so funny, but I, I thought I took him seriously. He said, I think we've almost got this figured out. And I thought, okay, here it comes. The next thing he's going to say is the method. And then he said, all we need you to do is break both our legs. Right. But I, I was still like, okay, they're going to say it now. It was both your legs. No, it was just one. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, obviously go back and watch it's on YouTube. You can watch the fullest experience. And that's when we hear the story about how you were in a car accident, broke your leg. And that's when you had plenty of time to think yeah. of this routine. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that now when you're about to perform, you hate it when someone says break a leg. I can't say it to anyone anymore. I can't, I have so many friends in theater and I can't say it because it yeah. just, it, now it means something else to me. And so I just, I just say, have fun. Have fun out there okay. to anyone who's about to go on stage. That makes sense. That's my new thing. Uh, now, was it just out of curiosity? Was it like that? What bone? Uh, it was or... my tibia. It, okay. it was broken in two places, like wow. right underneath my knee and then at my ankle. All right, but everything's fine now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I still have metal parts in my leg, so I have, oh. I have a cyborg leg. Like Iron Man. Yeah, so, so don't mess with that leg. But you're putting your best foot forward. <laughs> Indeed. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, skipping ahead to your second time uh, on Fools, which I find interesting about so many people are captivated in the, the attempt that they've got to fool them. Mm -hmm. And the second time, you, were no, you weren't concerned with that at all. No. Uh, and, and you did something that you knew, you knew that they knew that you knew that it wasn't going to fool them, and, but had fun with it. Uh, and can you talk a little bit about, about that experience? And, you know, not to reveal too much because I want everybody to watch it. Uh, but I, I think this is fascinating. Well, I pitched them again about five or six ideas, and this was the one they picked. And it was it was an effect I did when I was a kid, where I it looks like I'm sticking pins into my thumb, and I remember it horrifying growing ups when I was a kid, and wow. so I've done it ever since, <laughs> and because uh, it always gets visceral reactions from people, sure. and. Uh, so they picked that one, and I think they picked it because they know Allison Hannigan is squeamish. So they were like, oh, this is going to be fun because she's going to freak out. And at first they were like, well, can blood run down your arm while you're doing this? Like when you're Oh, they your... asked you that? Yeah, okay. the producers asked. And I was, wow. like, I was like, guys, that's not the game. You know, it's, it's kind of like the Barnum Museum. You know, some of the exhibits are real and some are fake and... And the game is to what degree am I being deceived and to what degree is this real? I was like, as soon as the audience thinks I'm really harming myself, the game is over. It's, right. not, it's not fun anymore. It's they're watching a guy torture. Yeah, it's not magic at all. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Anybody can bleed. Right. <laughs> Regular humans bleed. So, uh, you know, right. watching a wizard bleed just so makes sense. <laughs> I was like, that's not fun. So, uh, so I, I talked them out of the blood thing. <laughs> and it's a good thing I did because... When we recorded it, Allison Hannigan lost her mind. She was so freaked out. And it was all I could do to keep her in her seat and not run away from me. Like at one point, she actually turned her back to me and refused to even look. Wow. I mean, and it's not like you were slicing your wrist. It's just, it's a thumb. It was nuts. It was nuts. And they're not even really seeing it happen. Right. So, I, That's great. I, the only thing I could think of to like keep her engaged and not have her completely disengaged from me was to say her name over and over again. So I kept saying Allison, Allison at the beginning of almost every sentence. And it was just a way to like force her to look at me, right? Maybe she should have brought the bell back and hit it every I, time. I know, I know. <laughs> well, at one point she was like, I thought I liked you <laughs> because of the first time I was on. So it was, it was much longer than what you see in the episode because I had to really cajole her into participating in it. So they edited that thing brilliantly wow. to take out all of my, like, Allison, we need you to do this. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Wow. And 
I have to say, she she's she really makes that show. She's amazing in the TV she's audience. She's fantastic. TV audience doesn't see how much improv she's having to do with each of the guests yeah. while they're talking to themselves, and and just keep it keep the show going for the live audience. And that's the part the TV doesn't get to see. And yeah. like, wow, what what an amazing host she is, and uh, becoming a part of the magic world. Like here we are, all of us magicians saying her name. Like here's this actress that is now such a part of the magic world. It's and she's incredible. learned a little magic, and and I learned when I went back the second time, after we I won the first time, and I she jokingly said on camera, "Can I share the trophy?" Because that was me, I did that, you know, pick the right card yeah. and all that, and I was like, I was like, that was all you. So apparently after that, she asked them to give her a trophy. She was like. So she has a trophy that matches mine. Oh, I would say she deserves that trophy for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's cool. Um, so she was basically like your part of your duo act, yep. and you got, which actually yep. doesn't happen often uh, because we just learned that our mentalist couple here, they were they're one of the only teams that have actually been given two, so that they didn't have to like cut it in half. Oh, that's nice. Like, so I asked them. I said, "Who uh, the uh, Mysterian and uh, and Steffi?" I said, "Who?" Uh, who got the F and who got the U? You know, like, uh, and she's like, no, actually, they we have two. And I was like, that's wow, that's that's really. Good. And, they, and I, as far as they know, uh, they're the only ones. But now maybe you and Allison, the the other duo that yeah. I actually got the two trophies. Yeah, the other man. Uh, it's amazing. Um, yeah. And so if you add your two to my zero, that's actually two whole trophies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this talk show is really my ploy to get advice from people <laughs> because I still haven't done it and I want to go on the show. So I am soaking all of this up. Uh, well, so that I can use like my I said, ideas. don't hold back ideas. Pitch yeah. whatever thing you uh, That's great advice, actually, because some of the other advice I've gotten is don't do any card tricks. And I've got some great ideas for card tricks, but I was hold, I have been holding back, and so no more. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna flood their emails. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna say, have you ever seen the soap vanish? <laughs> you never they'll, know. They'll let you know. You yeah, know? Right? I mean, and sometimes it's like I said with the second time, it was just they thought this is gonna be great te television because Allison's gonna. Yeah, that's 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 funny. That, that that whatever the producers are gonna, whatever sparks their vision of what's right. gonna be entertaining, what's gonna be and good. something. And sometimes it has nothing to do with fooling them. Sure, and it shouldn't because. And that's what I realized as the show continued that they're uplifting the art. They're complimenting some of my great friends that with acts that they knew wasn't gonna fool them, but but they're getting complimented by Penn and Teller. And um, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter if you fool them, if you had a great time and you're able to get this amazing exposure. But there is always that that uh, pride of you have that trophy now. And you it is it. nice. I yeah. mean, it, it was cool. It w and it was a genuine surprise. I mean, I think if you watch that clip on my first time, you can see my jaw drop when I finally realized I had fooled that, them. That's my favorite moments is when the person thinks they didn't. Yeah. Uh, several times someone thinks that they did not fool them. They're pretty confident they didn't. And uh, and of course, sometimes Penn purposely twists it on them to right. make them think that and then go and then splits it and says, you get a trophy. Yeah, like, yeah. What? Uh, that's, those are great moments. And I love the way they set that up. Um, the producers beautiful. wisely gave us this talk before we did the shoot. And they said, just let go of the idea of fooling them. Just if you focus on that to the exclusion of everything else, you're going to ruin this experience for yourself. Because if you don't fool them, then you're going to be disappointed. It's going to color your sure. memory of the whole experience. They were like, just relax. Let that go. If you happen to fool them, icing on the cake. Right. If you don't, doesn't matter. Just go out there, have fun, do the best performance you can. And at the end of it, you'll have the best demo reel you could never have afforded to pay for. And, that, and you, have to have, you have to be relaxed and pull it off anyway. If you're going to fool them and hide whatever you're hiding... If you're too stressed about it, which most people are backstage just so stressed out, if they're focused on fooling that they're probably not going to do it. Right. Um, so that's going to probably increase your chances of yeah. being smooth and natural. Yeah, just go out and be you, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, Pez. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have a pet, take a Pez and relax. Beautiful. <laughs> and uh, so I, and the reason I saw it, I got to see the Pez bit uh, and your whole act, I made sure that the first night I was here, in case things got busy, that I, I got in the back and, and watched your show. Um, so I, I'm guessing we probably need to wrap this up uh, because it's time to drink. Uh, we both got done. Uh, oh, no, no, it's not your time. You, you no, both, I still you, have a set. He's got to work. I got to wrap this up. He's gotta, it's my, I'm finished. You got to work. Uh, but I just wanted to, to see if you could say a few words about um, this beautiful theater and where we are. Because, I mean, I, I, I introduced that we're here and that you 
the first to work here, but I'm blown away by this. So anything you'd like to share about the 654 Club, Chicago Magic Lounge? I mean, close-up magic is my favorite magic. I mean, the, the opportunity to afford to, to connect with people on a more intimate level, actually have a conversation with them and everything, and for the magic to be more personal for them is fantastic. And there are very few places like this where it's a small theater and that where you can do close-up magic and it can be seen. And uh, so this is, this is fantastic. In fact, if we could maybe pan a little bit over and get a view of, of where, I'm not sure how close up we are. We're in the front row here of what seats about 40. 42, I think. 42 seats. And uh, so this this is it. All these people just have a perfect view of the tabletop and you know small magic going on. In fact, I watched David do a, a trick with a, a dime and a penny and a nickel. <laughs> and uh, you can see everything beautiful. I'm in the back row and I can see everything perfectly what he's doing. And uh, it's not very often as magicians we get a beautiful space to really honor our craft. And uh, this is set up so perfectly. And uh, I think such a great honor that you were the first to uh, do yeah, your show. Yeah, it was fantastic. It just, it was a lucky thing. I, I just wrapped up my show at another theater that had been running for 10 years. And they were like, well, we're building this new place, this wow. multi-million dollar facility devoted to magic. Pick a day of the week and it's yours. And I said, okay, how about Wednesday? And uh, I said, I've got, a, I've got a show title and a concept that I've had in my back pocket for years. And I just, I haven't had a place to test it. I was like, um, it's called David Parr's Cabinet of Curiosities. And there'll be like a, a sort of shelf on the stage with all these weird artifacts. And there'll be times in the show where the audience can pick which artifact we'll examine next. And each one has a story, something magical happens with it. And then we move on to the next one. No, was that was in this room or was it on the that was on the main oh, that stage. was on the main stage. Okay, yeah. so I haven't seen that. So so what I, the show I saw is completely different. Yeah, uh, and that and that's your close up show. So you were actually the first to perform the stage show. Yeah, excellent. All right. Yeah, oh, beautiful. And yeah. uh, love the performance here. I was completely captivated. We had a great time, and I think that's that's what magic is about. Uh, when you watch a, a room of people that just are sucked into a whole nother world and mystified and they become children again, just enjoying magic for what it is. So. Yeah, well, and connecting with us. I, I mean, the, if the audience walks out and they don't feel they've gotten to know me as a person, then I, I failed, I think. They, they should know like, you know, who I am, what kind of person I am, what, what it would be like to con converse with me, you know, what my interests and obsessions are and all that. Which is important because I wouldn't have, having heard of you before i wouldn't have thought you so approachable uh just because you know how magicians can be and so uh and from the get-go you were just so humble and uh i felt like wow i'm really getting to know who you are as a person and um, from the moment you walked in the dressing room and not once did i think oh here's just one of these magicians that's all full of himself you um you portray that and, and i think you portray that in your act so i appreciate oh, thank that thank you i appreciate thank the you. performance and thank you for taking this time before your next uh performance to do this with us. Um, so we want to thank David and um, this is uh, this is going to be great. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to remind you when uh, when it airs and I hope that Dude, we do yeah. more of this. I, I plan I plan to pick his brain a lot more and share some of my ideas to see what I can do with them. Um, but this has been fantastic. I've loved this uh, this whole week in this journey. Great to meet you. And, uh, and yeah. good luck with this next performance. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you so much. All Bye -bye. right. Bye. And I'll actually be able to pick his brain in just a moment because he's here with us now, ladies and gentlemen, and he's behind the scenes. But uh, I don't know how we went over time. I was paying attention to the time this was pre-recorded. You would think I would nail it. I'm sorry, Sean. I'm trying to learn. Okay. I don't know. I get sick of these young kids coming up going, have you read The Wheel of Time? And I'm like, it's called a clock, you idiot. But obviously... I should read the book. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Math makes no sense to me anymore. But guess what? Uh, for those of you that can stick around, we got to end the Facebook performance. We got to end the IBM segment of the show, but we're going to continue the stream going because we have David Parr with us. So I get to do my Q&A. Here he is, David Parr in the house. This is live. This is not pre recorded. This is not some type of camera trick. <laughs> Or maybe it is. It could be, actually. We have no way of proving <laughs> that, yeah. 
<laughs> you do have the stereotypical uh, background of magic type of apparatus looking devices behind you. Well, yes. this was where I did my virtual. This is the set of my virtual show, The Sorcerer's Lair. Oh, nice. Oh, The Sorcerer's for, Lair. For two that's years. The, uh, that's the 13th book of Harry Potter, I believe. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> so lots of this stuff was propage from the show. Like, ah. I'd just reach behind me and grab a thing. It was like a virtual version of my Cabinet of Curiosity show. It sounds similar to the Cabinet of Curiosities, but if like you stepped it up a notch and put it in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is is wow. propage a word? Is that it is, is that now. A, it if is Shakespeare now it, could invent words, so can boom. I. Boom. That's the English <laughs> language people. We invent words. Boom. All right. So uh you only get a taste of David. You only get a taste because they we we are limited in time, which means you have to find my Twitch channel to continue this conversation. So I'm gonna ask David. If I am to show a break video in between now and when we continue talking, should it be your actual fooling them where you fooled them YouTube video or should it be the second one where you knew you weren't even trying to fool them? Well, the first one, I think. Okay, well, I would think so, too, because yeah. I think like and especially being in the dressing room when the mentalist was trying to read your mind and couldn't. <laughs> Because it kept asking you how it was done, it you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's the one. So uh, I think I have it. So bear with me here. I'm gonna keep David on here, and thank you so much for being here. This is awesome. Uh, I I I love like watching this back. I'm just I'm sad to be back home. I want to be back with you guys in Chicago. Yeah, this is ama yeah. Th that was, was amazing. Fun. That was great. Was fun. I think it's really. It's really amazing when anyone goes to the effort of putting us in an environment where the art can shine. Right. You know? Yeah. There, there was a, a lesson I've learned over the years, and that's that the atmosphere and environment can support the magic or it can undermine it. And that, you know, and it's an important lesson. Uh, and there the atmosphere supports the magic. Absolutely. And yeah, there's enough that and and really it's not even about supporting the magic. It's about supporting the positive, the imagination, the anything that is not you tapping into negative on social media, you know? We have enough in the world that takes us away from magic. So like, why not bring it back? And yep. uh I think I have the right one. Let's see. Oh, oh no, I got the second one. Okay, hold on. Sorry, my fault. It says uh, David Parr makes Allison Hannigan freak out. So we can talk more about that one, but I know I should show them where you actually got the trophy. So one second, because uh, yeah, that's the other one, which which is great. Uh, but no blood, no blood. No. Okay. I mean, if you want the YouTube link, I probably have it. No, I got it now. I just well, oh, I have okay. both of them, so I just hit the wrong one. All right, so I'm going to throw it to that. We're going to take a, a quick break, and then uh, we're going to come back and because we have to close the uh, the Facebook. I'm already over time, and then we're going to keep it going for 30 minutes or so, and I can ask you all the personal questions I didn't get a chance to. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not there and can't punch you. Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, virtually, we'll figure. I mean, who knows? It's the future. <laughs> Let's see if I can add this to the stream. Make sure we have sound. Guys, let me know if we don't have sound. I'm going to I'm gonna put me and David backstage, and then we're going to come back in just a moment. And uh, those of you that don't know, we'll put the Twitch channel in the chat. Join us so we can do a little longer uh, interview about magic. to fool Penn and Teller, and this next act is truly one of a kind. Take a look. When I was growing up, I was a very solitary kid, and I could spend hours and hours in my room reading. Human beings are story-consuming machines. I tend to look at each piece of magic as a story. I write the end first. That's just an easy way for me to structure my work. The ideal scenario is at the end of this piece of magic, Penn and Teller look at each other and they go, 
Mm -hmm. You got it. You fooled us. That's my ideal scenario. From Chicago, Illinois, please welcome the devious David Parr. Hi, I am David Parr. Allison, I will need your help. Will you join me? Sure. I have a seat for you here. Oh, why, thank you. My lady. Ooh. Allison, we are going to play a little game. Okay. And the name of this game is Follow the Leader. <laughs> okay. So, watch carefully, wait for the bell, and then act accordingly. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. All right. We fooled them? I don't know. Come on, cause can I share the trophy if we did? Cause like that was kind of me. That was all you. <laughs> now uh, this has a cool backstory. Yeah, what is that? About a year ago, mm -hmm. I was hit by a car Ooh. outside of the airport in Chicago, and the impact snapped my leg in two places. Uh, this is not a cool story so far. Well, it has a happy ending. Okay. So uh, I was out of commission for three months. I couldn't walk, I couldn't drive. So to maintain my sanity mm -hmm. while I was stuck in the house for months on end, I decided to focus all my energy on developing one new piece of magic that I could then perform in the show when I recovered. And you've just experienced the result of that three months of effort. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's I don't really want to break my leg to come up with something that cool. But what a great way to turn a bad situation into something positive. Exactly. And it's totally ruined the showbiz phrase, break a leg. Yeah. I cannot say it to anyone anymore. No. No, you just say good luck at yeah. that point. Yeah. Ready to find out what they think? Gentlemen? Uh, I think we can figure this out. Um, 
I think we're almost there. All we'd like you to do is break both our legs. <laughs> Leave us in the hospital for a year, and we believe we can get it. Happily. We don't think there's a deck switch. We don't think there's marked cards. We don't think there's double backers. We don't think there's double facers. Uh, we don't think Jack. Uh, we have no idea. I mean, no idea. After 10 minutes, they had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> David Parr with the Fullers Trophy, who won one for Allison as well. So we hear the part where she says, uh, I should get one too. And she did. We share the trophy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and so well deserved. And somehow I missed the dialogue and so did Penn because I think Penn and myself would have both held back on that joke had we realized you had already said it. The break a leg joke. Like, I missed that. So did he because he still brought it up. So so did I. Like, oh, I bet you don't say break a leg. And you covered that with Allison. You're like, okay, that's old news. Yeah, we did that joke. <laughs> But I watched no, the whole thing. Never somehow I missed it. Never gets probably because probably because I missed it because I was busy with my own thoughts, writing it down as it was happening. Uh. <laughs> like I was writing down the joke like I'm gonna say break a leg, and I and you were busy saying it. Yeah. So stock line. Let's just say that's a stock line. Yeah. But as long as you put your best foot forward. Indeed. That's what's important. Get it? Yeah, but to get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I what the main thing I love is the confusion because of the fact that you really thought you didn't get it. They had plenty of time. Um, it's so funny considering now that like I whispered in your ear and they spent time making diagrams. You know, yeah. it's, it yeah. says a lot about perspective, right? Yeah. I mean, I think in the moment it's hard to – it's easy to get caught up in it when you're there because the get back and forth game of it is so fun. And then, and then when it gets to the end, it's like, Oh no, wait, it's, it's very difficult to remember all the steps and in the proper order, right. To, yeah. to reverse engineer it, you have sure. to know exactly what happened. And uh, so you, I think you were able to do it because you you weren't in the moment. You could yeah, I wasn't in the moment from objectively. And I, I was almost watching it on mute because we were back in that same area where it was loud, and Meadow was showing me the video, and as as I'm seeing the trick, it was like, it was just that I was I was getting just the basics, right? And I went, I said, I I said at that moment, I said I have a theory. And I didn't tell her, I didn't tell anybody. And it wasn't until I told you in the dressing room what my theory was. And I was like, Chris, stop talking. Mysterian, stop it. I just, can I tell him my theory? I don't figure stuff. Can I tell him my theory before? Because he was like, how many questions? A hundred questions he asked you? Like, <laughs> yeah, the the no mentalist list. like way <laughs> over-examined it. And I just whispered in your ear and he's like, give me a clue. I'm like, there is no clue. You either got it or you don't, you know, like, right. and, right. uh, that was, yeah, that was nuts. But uh, that I'm not one that usually can figure stuff out. I usually get help. Okay, so I usually go, I'll watch it five times, and then I'll call Sean Farquhar, and I'll go, I don't understand. <laughs> He'll go like, watch it another 12 times, and then you'll get it. And I was like, I watched it, I, okay, I watched it 12 times. No, you didn't. Watch it again. And, <laughs> so, and, then, and then eventually, you know, he'll share it with me. But, yeah, I'm not one that, that figures things out. But would you say they – they overthought it or they just went down the wrong rabbit hole? I think they just got sucked into the game of it and then it was too late to, to go back. And um, so uh, I that's what most of my friends said when they saw it the first time. It just they forgot to look for signs of the method. And, that's beautiful. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. So, yay. <laughs> I have friends who still don't know how it's done and they don't ever want to know. Yeah, I well, I still don't know the mechanics. I just guessed the one thing, but like, uh, how? 
hurting it. If you eliminated the bell completely and did something else or whatever, like would do you think it would have affected it misdirection yeah, wise? Definitely. I don't think it would have been as as um deceptive. Wow. The, the bell adds to the game the game like aspect of it, right? But beyond that, it kind of in a way it almost short circuits the brain. Yeah. And um yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it misdirected me because the yeah. time when she didn't hit it and I was like, you got to hit the bell. It became it's such an issue that whatever was going on in that moment, obviously I missed because I was so focused on the fact that, Allison, you need to hit the bell. That's the rule. That's how this yeah. game works. Yeah. So yeah. I, I was just as misdirected. Yeah. Right. And that makes it difficult to remember what exactly happened during those moments. Yeah. It's it's almost like a natural OCD misdirection. Hmm. Like we, we all have a, a, a little bit of OCD that if, if we lead them down that path where they just expect that's got to happen. Does that make sense? Like, a, I don't know what to call it. There's got to be like a phrase we can come up with for like a. a like those who don't have OCD, but like a natural. You know what it reminds me of there's there have been studies now about this phenomenon, and it's a it's a legit psychological phenomenon, and it's the phenomenon of you went into another room to look for something, and then when you arrive in the next room, you don't know what you went in there for. Story of my life. Thank right. you. That's what I spend about ninety percent of my day doing, which is why I have this guy, which I don't know why because I wasn't looking for him. <laughs> But there's a they they are now sort of picking that apart to discover why moving to another room affects us that way psychologically, and uh, so they're they're starting to understand the basis of why that works in our brain that way. And I think the bell functioned that way for me. It was like going into another room. Okay, so you don't have an answer. I was waiting for an answer. Like, uh... <laughs> Uh, it's kind of funny because there's at least two people on the headset with me who experienced me walking into my room, looking for my glasses three times, three times going, what was I looking for? Come back. Oh, my glasses walk back. Oh, I need to fill the cat food container. What was I looking for? My glasses. <laughs> like yeah, every time. Yeah. 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 Well, now there's been an interesting thing happening over the past couple of decades, and that's that neuroscientists have discovered magic. Oh. And so now there's been this wave finally of, of neuroscientists publishing work that that studies how magic can show us how the brain works. And uh, and so there have been over the past couple of decades, there have been lots of books published about this subject. And it's, it's really cool because, uh, because magic really can teach us things about how our brains work. Um, it just, it. Yeah, it's, it just took, uh, you know, neuroscientists uh, a few hundred years to get there. Well, that makes sense because, okay, I'll relate it to my cats. Uh, I put my TV on the cat TV YouTube mm -hmm. and I don't remember in my past, my cats watching TV, right? Like they never <laughs> did that. But now my cat meows at me when I don't, he wants me to put it on YouTube and, and he wants to watch the TV. And so then I saw I, I, to the television now, like a teenager. And, and I saw a documentary where it explained that that the frame rate that we you know the old TVs we used to have did not have a frame rate that the cats could even analyze it made no, it was just noise but oh. now we have the HD TVs where the cats are like that's a bird and it's huge i don't know what whoa can right. i get it this, you know it looks real and the motion's fluid now and now you have cats watching TV wow that's that's wild Oh, that's, I never even would have thought of that. That's interesting. And yeah, now we can communicate with, with our pets. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. talking to you. I would not, you not, I wasn't talking to you. 
And that, so, that's like, it. you no know, foul, all the old, foul movies, language. old movies and TV shows when they're using a CRT type screen, uh, the old tube screens, when they, when they show you shows an actor like typing away on a computer or whatever, the stuff that they're looking at on the screen is garbage. They can't even read it because it's, they, it's set up to look good on a camera, but not to the human eye. So right. they're looking at a scrambled screen or a blank screen that'll be added later in post in all these old movies and stuff where they're like fascinated at what's on the screen or, or they're typing stuff. It's uh, it's cool to think about. Uh, but now with with LED screens, they're, you're actually seeing the screen that they're seeing. Well, supposedly. Like I a mean, cat. Yeah, but we don't know what they're seeing, and that's the thing. It's like, like maybe aliens are going like we've been giving them the signal for like a while now, and they're just <laughs> like they just they're just get not it. getting it. Like, what is wrong with these humans? And we're going, what signal? There's no aliens, and the whole time they're going, there was fireworks, but it was mm. in a, you know a different dimension, or we couldn't. It was a frame rate. Who knows? Magic takes advantage of our of our brain's laziness. <laughs> Meadow Perry is. Oh, very nice! Wow, that's a great quote. We've actually got some. I hope we're writing these down. We got some great quotes. <laughs> awesome. That's funny. That's, that's funny. beautiful. Um, I love this quote, where it says it makes sense. CRTs are probably probably blinding to cats so now you and i can determine what the hell is crt what do you think it is it's computer relay terminal isn't it i think it's circus relay traditions <laughs> so one of the maybe we, i think one of us is right we'll see cathode ray tube cathode ray <laughs> It's a cathode ray tube. It's a cathode ray tube. Yes. Yeah. So it's the it's a cat. Tube. A cat has a. It's a cathode. A cat has a ray tube. It communicates with. It's like a tube, and it meows, and it echoes. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the acronym game. So you don't know for sure, but you convinced me you did. See, that's how powerful the magic is, or the misdirection. So I have I have to ask since you saw my close up set at the Chicago Magic Lounge. Yes. What, what was your favorite part of it? Oh, um, okay. Well, I really appreciated the opener because it was so well done, and I, the whole time I wasn't sure what was happening, and the, it was basically what thing? it was a two card Monty. Ah. And I, I do I do a two what I call a two card Monty. Uh, which is essentially a three-part phase of you remember David Blaine's? I don't know if he called it that, like uh, with the aces and the queens. Mm -mm. Well, it's just the same name, but everything's face down in the hands, and it's totally different because you're putting it behind your head, like everything's open and behind your head. Like this is this is your two hard Monty. Like what's happening here? And, uh, yeah, I was experiencing it as a magician and as a, as a magician, I was still confused. So I was looking Good. around going, Oh my God, I feel bad for these laymen because their brains are melted, <laughs> you know? And it, it, it had, I had this moment of like, I, I at least have theories. You people are screwed. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's fantastic when magicians get fooled again. Because it, oh, it's yeah. a reminder of why we got into it in the first place. Yeah, it's, totally. It's a reminder of what that feeling is like of not knowing. And it's easy to lose track of that as we, you know, venture behind the curtain of magic. It's easy to sort of get kind of jaded about it and bored and forget what that feeling is like. Right. Um, I, I mean, I, honestly, I think that's why Penn and Teller created that show. Was that so they get to experience that feeling? They, over they wanted and over. that feeling. They were like, yeah. fool me, damn it. Right. That should, that, should, it, that should be the name of it. Fool us, damn it. That should be, <laughs> or you else. know? Yeah. Or else. Like, we're sick of seeing the same tricks over and over and over and over and over. What do you got? Right. 
Uh, there's a question here. Did David work for the Chicago Magic Lounge during COVID and how did they handle that? Just wondering. Oh, good question. Um, I did not. They had a virtual show um, running from the Magic Lounge, live from the Magic Lounge. I was doing my own virtual shows over the course of two years, and it was called The Sorcerer's Lair. And this is where it took place. And, um, and I lots of the material I did in my close-up set was developed for my virtual show. And then once we, I went back to in-person, I just adapted it for, for performing in person. But uh, I honestly found the virtual environment liberating um, creatively because it was like, wow, I can use methods here I couldn't ever use in person. And so I, I just, my mind just raced with possibilities. And uh, so I, I developed lots and lots of new material during the pandemic. Um, Cause there's, I mean, just this visual frame alone gives us so many possibilities because all kinds of shenanigans can be happening outside <laughs> of the visual frame. Right. Uh, and nobody knows. I know. Cause <laughs> like, that's where I keep this rubber chicken. Right. Right. So it could be just inches outside that frame. All kinds of shenanigans could be going on. So uh, that kind of thinking was just like, oh, there's there's just endless, endless possibilities here. Um, so I actually uh, really, really blossomed creatively uh, during the pandemic. And uh, I, I don't think I've created that much new material in a shorter time ever in my career before. Wow. Um, I think it so. affected people in different ways. Like I learned to, uh, I can sneeze, uh, green screen residue. <laughs> see, this is, <laughs> see, you see how weird this is? Like this is, it's hanging from my nose and this is some type of molecules, but it doesn't make any sense to a layman, to a magician. Doesn't it's even like, make sense to a cat. It doesn't make sense to a cat. <laughs> it's 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 like it's nasty but it's not you know it's like but it's not real but yet at the same time it it exists and it's like green screen residue it's That's weird cool. That's you know cool. um but is, is it, it magic i don't know uh it says david has an is there any magic in his lair he could show us <laughs> oh i could i could okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You, you're under no requirement uh, I, I don't know if I told you that all my guests have no requirement to do a trick, but yet if they want to perform something, they are encouraged. Well, I'll, I'll show them the Monty thing. That was your favorite part of the show. All right. I'm going to put you on. Uh, oops. I put me on big screen. That's not what we want. We want like, wait, how do I uh, switch it? Damn it. Uh, like the, nope. That's back to me. Wait, where do I, I want to, I want to give it to, ah, come on. I want to, I want to, I want to highlight you. God. Ah. No, no, I, you're gone. Wait, there. <laughs> oh, that was crazy. That was crazy. Michael, are you still here? He vanished. But all right, but I am. But I'm trying to put picture in. I'm trying to give you. I was spotlighted for a second there. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight you again. Do you need me to talk? Because they won't. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta be the other participant in this. Oh. Okay. Well then. All right. Let's do. Let's. Do, is this good or? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It just so, doesn't um, let me highlight. it. This is like the Zoolander Zoom where so I'm you, always on have camera. To, you'll have to pretend you've never seen this before. Okay. Okay. I'll pretend. Okay. So, Michael. There are many ways of thinking about magic. One of the ways of thinking of it is that it's a kind of game. And the game is basically this. To what degree am I being deceived and to what degree is this real? So bearing that in mind, we're going to play a little game. Now, have you ever heard of or seen the famous game of chance and skill known as the three-card Monty? I've heard of it. Ah, okay. So then we won't play that. <laughs> we'll play a different game. <laughs> a game with two cards. And your powers of observation and deduction. Are you ready to play? Yes. Okay, good. Now, I have here a red queen and a black nine. Uh, back in old timey times, this game was sometimes called Find the Lady. 
because the object was to track the location of the queen and thereby win the game. Now, Michael, <laughs> where is the queen? It's, it's far in your head. It's... Okay, okay, maybe I didn't explain the object of the game well enough. <laughs> Let's. That's my bad. That's my bad. Let's just go back to the beginning. Um, it's a gameplay with two cards and your powers of observation and deduction. And let me make, make it very clear this time. The object of the game is to track the location of the queen, not the nine, the queen. And this time I'm going to make it very simple. Michael, where is the queen? Damn it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in your hand. Well, yes, technically it is in my hand. <laughs> mm. Okay, new plan. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Actually, I'm going to let you in on the secret. The reason this game is so difficult to win is because the human brain is constantly editing out information that it assumes is irrelevant. For instance, Michael, did you happen to notice that these cards are face-to-face -face on this side? but they're back to back on this side. Did you notice that? <laughs> no, of course you didn't. No one would. Because when people see two cards face to face, like, <gasps> their brain automatically assumes they'll be face to face on the other side. That's just how brains work. <laughs> you seem more puzzled than ever. Yeah, that I was messes hoping that me. was going to help. I was hoping that would help you win the game. Okay. Listen, we're just going to we're going to play one more round. And this time I'm going to I promise I'm not going to hide any cards behind me and I'm not going to make any false moves. Are you following along with me so far? Yeah. Okay, good. Keep following along. Where's the queen? Right hand. This one? You got it. Michael, I helped a little. <laughs> wow. There it is. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be honest. That did not help at all. <laughs> Good. Um, Good. In fact, it made it worse because I watched the whole routine from the back row and in my mind i thought i had it but i just didn't see it but now i realize i was just being a cocky magician oh that's that's great because so you noticed something different this time i noticed something different in that oh. my confusion was from 63 percent to 92 percent. that's cool uh yeah no i noticed that quite a few things like i didn't remember seeing that i saw two backs at once i didn't remember seeing that when you turn them over <laughs> you know what the most confusing thing for me is when you say when you look at this side they're face to face and this side they're back to back that i can't even process like i don't know if it's right or wrong my brain just goes mush like i think is i think it makes is what he is he being honest i don't know i'm gonna trust him because he looks like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was your that's, undoing. God, um, that's a great one. Yeah, that's if there's any comfort in this, that is the part where I can see magicians' brains breaking. <laughs> because up to that point, they think they know what's happening. And then that happens and they're like, uh uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh and and I realize now at the end that it disproves a lot of theories at the very end. Yes. That yeah. that seeing it, which you know, I don't want to condone magic on video, but now that I'm seeing on video and having seen the routine live, it's actually making it more confusing, which is good. But <laughs> good. for the most part, I don't want to condone magic on video because it's not the same. You have to see it live. It isn't the same, but I think magicians were unfair in complaining about it. And that's that there are ways in which this is it's just a different experience. It's a different sure. experience. It's not necessarily an inferior experience because when when you're performing magic like this on video, um, it feels like you're sitting directly across the table from me, right? Like we're sitting at a cafe and I'm showing you magic. We're right across the table. 
So there's a kind of intimacy that's created by the screen that you don't have when you're 20 feet away in a theater, right? So that's an advantage. The advantage is it feels like you're seeing even more here, right? Because it feels like you're right up close. Yeah, but it's more deceiving because what's more dangerous? You on Zoom or you across from me at a coffee shop? Yeah. What's more dangerous? At a coffee shop, you already have my wallet. <laughs> but here, like I said, there are methods that I can use that I couldn't even use in person. True. Now, I mean, I, I just need uh, green green screen material. <laughs> I mean, there's there's things we can do. But, you know. Like, but the way I performed that was identical to the way you saw it in the theater. I, I know, I know. I yeah. watched really, really closely. <laughs> so, wait, that, wait, did you submit that one, or what, like, I pitched uh, it to fool us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they they turned it down, but but you never know what the deal is. It might be yeah. just oh, we reached our quota of magicians for this season, and pitch it again well, next season. Well, that happens when you miss the deadline. Um, no, I no, was like, the, like I was, I was I missed, deadline. Uh, no, no, me. I, yeah, I had a but, great act, but I, I sent it to him like two weeks after they asked for it. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah no, you, you just, we had a, we had a hurricane. We had a hurricane in new Orleans. It's a regular, I have an excuse. Or the other thing that can happen is they book someone who's doing a, another version of the three card Monty, right? True. That, yeah. They, they already booked it. So so I always, whatever they've turned down ends up going back into the hopper to repitch next time. You know? True. Just run it back through. So uh, I have five ideas. <laughs> Are any of them good? <laughs> well, they're all good, but uh, I'm going to tell you about one of them that's not totally fleshed out. But just because no one's going to do it, so I can go ahead and share it. Uh you know, it's going to take some work, but essentially, did you see when Greg Fruin did his straight jacket routine on Fool Us? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, imagine it. You know Greg Fruin? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Imagine his straight jacket act on, on anything. It's intense, okay. right? Okay. Right. Music and girls and lights and like, boom. And like, da 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 da. Okay. I want to start the same way. And then attempt to like never escape the straight jacket. Just do sleight of hand while in a straight jacket. So like there's no escape. The music stops and I go, here's what I'm going to do. And I proceed to do like a linking rings or something. But I, I'm in the straight jacket. It, it, now, are you just doing a bit right now, or is this an no, idea? No, 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 this, this is this is the fifth idea. No, this is actually okay. This is the I fifth idea. Tell. No, I've, I have notes. This is the fifth idea, but it's like uh, you know, sleight of hand with no hands. That's and, that's a cool idea. Okay, well, but yeah, and it's got to be fleshed out. It's just an idea, but that's number five. That's why I can talk about it on TV because mm. that's my fifth idea. The other four, I you well, I told you a little bit about the the first one. And then there's there's three more ideas, and one of them is similar to what you fooled them with. So I gotta I gotta pick your brain about it at another time. But oh, okay. but I do have an idea for a straight jacket where I never I never, I don't even attempt to escape. That's not even part of it. But my hands are bound. Okay. And and I still I still do sleight of hand. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't. Well, I, I haven't worked out on the method. There. Yeah. It's a concept. It's a concept. Yeah. It's worth a it's worth a pitch. And then I do have a two card Monty routine that's very different than your two card Monty routine. Well, damn it. Yeah, but I don't. I don't <laughs> that's not that's not one I, I I don't see doing that on Penn and Teller because the card trick I want to do is where the cards are imaginary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All so right. like there's you know there's no cards because you have to imagine. It's kind of a Zen thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. that's what every morning I think about it and I I meditate. <laughs> it's yeah. like there is no spoon. There is no spoon, but there is a sword. Shing! Ah! What? Yes! <laughs> if only I had had a spoon ready, though, that would have been better. A spoon would have been better, you know.
Uh, here's here's something funny. I, I pre-recorded your interview, the sentimentalist interview, the inter the uh, tour of the Chicago Lounge, right? And I was like, I'm just gonna, you know, in between, come on live and and introduce these segments. It added up perfectly to the perfect amount of time, and somehow. Mm -hmm. Time doesn't exist. I still was like, when we finished your interview, I was 20 minutes over my my time slot. Because time expands, man. Oh. Yeah. Could, could you expand on that theory? <laughs> In virtual space, time expands. I love this. Please explain. Yeah. Remember all these times during pandemic time where it was like, oh, I have to log on for this, for this Zoomy thing at such and such time. And then it's like the time just... It's like comes and goes and you're like, oh, no, I, I missed it. Or you try to think back to the before times and it like seems like ages ago and it's really just a year ago. Right. right. So yeah. the time this this whole experience of the pandemic has messed right. with our sense of time. I totally. Yeah. Yeah. We stuff no that happened in the before times seems like it was a decade ago. Yeah. Well, New Orleans people kind of understand because we have pre-Katrina. Uh, right, right, right. We had an apocalypse. So like 16 years ago, we're like, oh, yeah, that was our first apocalypse. And then we had COVID. So we're like, that's how I tell time. Was that was that before the hurricane? Was that before the storm? Like sure. Dwight Schrute would yeah. say, yeah, ever since the storm. Yeah, so, so that we call this yeah. big traumatic event yeah. that messed with time. Oh, totally. that's interesting. So you had a rehearsal for it. We we basically yeah. Well, New yeah. Orleans has been in rehearsal for a while. We rehearse every year around this time. Uh, <laughs> we, the we give a, yeah, we give it different names. You know, we <laughs> give the rehearsals different names. But either way, there's a rehearsal coming through. Usually, we rehearse in Puerto Rico first, and right. then then we do the dress rehearsal here. So like. <laughs> the rehearsal hits Puerto, Puerto Rico and then and then comes here but yeah so uh it's just part of our you know our, our lifestyle and people go like I don't understand you how you can live there and I go because that's where we live right you know yeah you, just, you, you adjust yeah you figure it out yeah it just becomes I, part of your your life you learn how to you learn how to look for a piro piro is is you know what a piro is no. Oh, it's like it's a Cajun canoe, a piro. It's like a dugout canoe. Oh, okay. So, like, if if there's a flood, you you should have a piro. All right. Yeah. Okay, writing that down. It's a. I would like to say that it's my quote, but I think somebody. I think Ryan Reynolds said it. I think it was a, a, a Ryan Reynolds quote in one of his movies. He's like, he's so brilliant, you know, in all of his movies. Can't wait for Deadpool 3. Is there going to be a Deadpool 3? Chimichanga. Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. amazing. So uh, can somebody write the the right spelling of Piro? Because that's not correct. No onion. No, that is that's not the clown. That's a clown Piro. <laughs> That's yeah. Oh yeah. So it that can be a Piro as well. And if you if you're really good at it, can avoid a hurricane. Like if you're clowning. <laughs> well, if you're like a superhero clown, you can Piro your way out of a hurricane. But uh, uh, no. Is anybody Indeed. gonna? Oh, ape. Abel got it. Uh, well, there we go. So I'm gonna leave that up. There's, uh, yeah, a piro. P i r o g u e. It spells like it spells like a sound. There's a Polish fool. There, wait, what? There's a Polish. Pierogi. Piro oh, yeah. pierogi. Yeah. <laughs> well. That's what you're supposed to pack for your lunch when you're in a piro. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. you got you got to keep it dry, so you pack a, a pierogi. Yeah. So basically, originally Native American dugouts, piros dug out of a tree. Um, but it, oh, the word yeah. is French. 
uh, you would generally bring your cat with you and you would leave your children. Uh, that's the way the, the original Cajuns did it. So like when a hurricane would hit, uh, they would say pack pack the, the, the animals and then the kids would stay home to try to protect the home and then they would die, you know, and then you'd be left with the pets and then the old Cajuns. And that's why nowadays nobody understands when Cajuns talk. Okay. Can, can I I saw a ghost? What just happened there? What... <laughs> it's the sorcerer's lair is haunted. <laughs> that was amazing because I was like, wait a minute, I didn't do that. So <laughs> what's going on? That's crazy. I love it. Beautiful. Eat a pierogi and a pierogi while doing a pirouette with Pierrot the clown. Oh, nice. All right. Uh, so I, I don't want to keep you all night, even though I could, because I can stay up all night because I'm in New Orleans. Uh, and I hope that you can come visit me. So, and, and, you know, the SAM convention is in New Orleans next year. You've so. never been there. I've never visited there. You've never been here? No. Never That's have. why you don't know what a Piro is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Among other reasons. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah everybody cool. tells me I'd love it there. But oh, uh, for sure, for sure. Just never had occasion to visit. So good excuse next July. Except that it's going to be hot, but that's OK. I'm planning indoor activities. Yeah. Yeah. No, but the SAM convention is in New Orleans. Oh. First first convention in 20 years. Interesting. In no, New Orleans. Yeah. That. First magic convention in 20 years in New Orleans. So, uh, but you know, you can come sooner than that and hang out for sure. I'm making a note of this actually. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't have the dates in front of me, but, uh, well, actually, wait, you did the ghost. I can do some kind of OBS trick. Wait a minute. Do I have the dates in front of me? Maybe I can find it. No, I don't feel like it. <laughs> okay. I, I had, I have the graphic here somewhere, but, uh, we might lose the stream. So anyway, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun because it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be here. It's party city, jazz music. We're, uh, we're going to make it amazing. And, uh, I hope to get as many magicians here as possible. Cause this is a magical city for sure. Magical city so with or without hear. magicians. It's a magical city. Yeah. So I hear. So, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to close it with this. Uh, I see that behind you is a telephone. Yes. All right. So if if you were to get a call on that phone from, let's say, the beyond or another dimension, who would be calling you right now to maybe predict? Someone's, <laughs> someone's calling you. <laughs> hello seven days seven days until what oh seven days until my auto warranty expires oh wow. thanks spooky phone so much drama <laughs> so much drama wow that was awesome <laughs> all right folks I hope that you've been able to tune in for a, a little special behind the scenes with David Parr. I was so fortunate to get to see his show and hang out with him and, and be part of the action in Chicago. I hope to be back. One of the first performers at the Chicago magic lounge and the oldest running magic show in Chicago. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't seen him live and in person, none of this does it justice. You have to experience the magic uh ladies and gentlemen and otherwise david parr thank you for thank you for having me on this was fun absolutely and we'll be uh we'll be back with more i'm gonna bring i'm gonna bring you back i'm gonna bring you back because that was too awesome we'll be back with more thank you guys for tuning in and uh i will see you soon this is hashtag not that magic mike signing out thank you david Bye bye, -bye.